Please welcome Martin Casado. All right. Listen, it's a pleasure to be here. I think this is the first time, and as long as I can remember, maybe two decades or I'm not standing in front of an audience as like a researcher, like I actually have no new ideas I'm talking about. Um, I'm not standing as a vendor. I did that for a long time. I have nothing to sell. And now I'm an investor. I'm certainly not standing up here as an investor because this is strictly a money losing proposition. Um, so I'm kind of I'm standing up as kind of part of like a rabble that has come together in a fairly ad hoc way that's been tilting at a fairly large windmill. Um, and, and as a result, it's kind of some of the most meaningful stuff I think I've worked on. Um, but we're in the pretty early stages, so I just kind of want to walk you through that. You know, it's been really in vogue in Silicon Valley in the last five to ten years to connect to the next billion, right? And normally this looks like people hopping on airplanes and going to sub-Saharan Africa or going to Amazonia or whatever and actually solving the connectivity problem, which is a huge problem. There's a lot of great work that's being done there. And, you know, I kind of got sucked in this conversation seriously maybe four years ago, three years ago, when a lot of the technology that we'd been working on, like Open vSwitch and some of the other stuff we've been working on, was starting to be pulled into these efforts. And so I started just looking at this problem kind of just as an independent, just to, uh, curiously. And I started to realize that actually within the United States, um, the problem is as acute and, and sometimes more acute than many areas of, of the world. I mean, if you take where we are right now, right? So we're in Las Vegas. If you drive about two hours south where I'm going after I give this talk, actually, you've got the Wallapai Reservation, and there basically is no connectivity at all. Um, in many Native American reservations, if you step outside of kind of the most population dense area, you have less than 20% connectivity. I mean, it's a real, real issue. And actually, you'll find in these areas that there's less connectivity within the United States than there is in um, many much less industrialized nations and, and, and less densely populated. So there's many issues with not having connectivity. There's one I'm going to talk about in particular. I don't want to belabor this point, but it's really simple. And it's the fact that, listen, if you don't have internet, it's hard to get a modern education. And by that, I mean we're in this kind of mania of you know, uh, e-learning. We're passing laptops out to kids. We've got these massive efforts. There are whole you know, you know, multi-hundred million dollar funds that are just towards e-learning. But the problem is, is like, listen, if, if your entire school is basically obviating books and focusing on e-learning and you go home and you don't have the internet, you're kind of sunk. And if you look at the state of the art for dealing with this, there's a bunch of, of, of great efforts, but they're pretty baroque. Or, you know, I would say they're, they're so much as medieval. Like, take, for example, this one. There's a number of efforts like this, which basically says, okay, like, we want kids to have a better education because the internet gives you a better education. A large percentage go home. They don't have access to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of school buses. We're going to park those school buses you know, around the town. And then if that doesn't touch your house, which in almost every case it doesn't, drive your car with your parents, no joke, um, and do your homework in the car by the school bus. Does that make sense? So it's kind of interesting because you know, a lot of us came up through the era of like one laptop per child and the whole thing. I mean, it seems to me that you know, the device is no longer the problem. Everybody's got a smartphone. You know, many people just use it that when they're in the city limits. I mean, like, I actually believe like, the digital divide problem really is a networking problem, certainly in the United States. So what we've been working on is a goal to find practical solutions to address this. Um, I mean, you know, this probably doesn't have to be said too loud. It's very unlikely that this will be uh, addressed by the traditional MNOs. Um, you know, the problem is like you can't find a solvent business model. I've spoken to many of them. I've tried to get them in. I've worked in a number of projects. And the problem is you just don't have the population density, nor the dollar amount per subscriber, nor it turns out the federal dollars to actually subsidize this. So using the traditional capital model, the traditional OPEX model, you just can't make it solvent. And because of Spectrum, which I'm going to talk about later, it makes it very difficult for new entrants. And if you look in the unlicensed Spectrum areas like Wi-Fi, like OPEX tends to crush you. So you end up having to charge just too much per person. So like, I'm working in areas where like, actually asking people to pay five bucks per month is a lot. right? So like, it's, I don't think it's very clear. Um, I think it's pretty clear that we're not going to, like, the reason this exists is because the MNOs have decided not to do it or aren't going to do it. And I don't see that that's going to be alleviated anytime soon. So the result is, you know, this is Peach Springs. You drive out there, you have, you have no signal. I also want to make a point that um, 
you know, even if you have a lot of funding, like some of the Native American reservations do, this is from the Navajo reservation, it still only tends to touch a portion of the population. So the best funded Native American reservation, I think for this, is the Navajos. They had a massive, massive effort to bring fiber and microwave um, and access around. It's a great effort. I think they've done a phenomenal job with it. But if you actually look at the population density, it doesn't overlay very well with this map. And now, again, we're telling these, these people that they cannot have connectivity. And there really isn't a lot of, of um, recourse for them. OK, so let me talk a little bit about why it's hard, because then I can go ahead and take a crack at solving it. Of course, as we know, it's very expensive to put up a cell tower, um, you know, leasing the land, or working with one of the tower things, or working with a local community. Um, the traditional model is incredibly expensive to set up a large tower. Of course, even if you set up a tower, you've got to deal with you know, the microwave to the backhaul. The backhaul is expensive. You know, Spectrum is really, 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 really expensive. And it's all kind of owned by people with a lot more money. So if you go to like you know, a 200-person reservation, you're like, buy some Spectrum. Like, they'll look at you funny. Um, and then they're actually, like, if you actually take it from a business standpoint, like CAC, customer acquisition, is a real issue. right? It's one thing to actually have the service. It's another thing to actually get access to the people that need it um, and to get them to, to sign up. And so normally, like to have like a CAC that makes sense, and then the density to make the business um, work, you actually have to have like a sales force or advertisement or marketing dollars. So this is the list of problems that I just talked about. Um, I'm just gonna just quickly. CapEx is high. Spectrum's an issue. Backhaul is an issue. You know, CAC are reaching people's hard and operational costs. I mean, these are all the issues. Very few of these are strictly technical issues, clearly. But I think to come up with a scale of problem, you have to solve them. You know, so I, I think in, in kind of a funny instance of like cosmic coincidence, it turns out like if you actually focus on the education problem, you can tackle a lot of these. And so this is what we've been doing. And I, I want to explain why. Um, and that's, so let me just explain it at a high level, and I'm going to go into more detail. Um, so but the first one is not an education thing. So actually, today, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, like actually you can put up a cell tower for less than 10K today. That actually has pretty good range. I'll talk about how you do that. So OK, so we can actually get the CapEx cost down. So it turns out that you can use useful spectrum if you focus on education. So EBS spectrum um, 2.5 has been allocated for educational use. So if you work with an educational institution, you get an access to that. And that has actually nice characteristics for setting up a cellular network. It has nice propagation characteristics. You can go through foliage. You get nice power density. You get reasonable range. So you're not like in the kind of Wi-Fi mess um, or kind of the higher spectrum mess, which actually a lot of, like when we talk to a number of WISPs, a lot of the problems with getting the cost down had nothing to do with CapEx or anything else. It was literally about like break fix and line of sight issues to deal with Wi-Fi. The interesting thing about backhaul, so there's been a massive funding initiative within the United States in the last 10 years to bring fiber to pretty much every school. The goal is something like 98 schools by 2020. So we've got this massively untapped fiber network going to schools. This was done under the Obama administration. Um, so if you're working with a school, not only do you have access potentially to the spectrum, you actually have backhaul, which is one of the biggest issues. And let me tell you, there's a school in almost every interesting locale um, uh, for the areas that we've looked at. Um, CAC, in this case, for us becomes pretty easy, which is, again, you're working through the schools. They have the students. They know the people that are in need. We're focusing on education. And, and this one I didn't appreciate until just recently. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but they actually have trained ICT staffs at most schools. And so if you can get the operations simple enough, you actually have local capacity building you can do within the, the, the local resources. I mean, there's no way, listen, I've got this ragtag group of people. It's a very talented group of people. We're working with a number of, of areas. But there's no way we can actually operate these networks. But it turns out the schools are very incented to do this. And they're very happy to work and do that. So let me kind of dig into a few of these. Um, it's not going forward. I may have run out of, oh, here we go. Oh. Sorry, guys. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> yeah, so I managed to crash this. OK, here we go. Uh, OK, so let me talk about how you, um, <laughs> how, how you build a, a cell tower for almost no money at all. So it turns out that you can, you can buy an eNode B for almost nothing. So this comes from a company called Biocells from Beijing. Literally, they <laughs> literally you, you, you pay them 3 or 4K or whatever they quote you. They'll throw it in a, in a box. It goes on a shipping container. And it you know, ends up you know, a few months later, you pay for the import tax, and you're good to go. Um, 
So uh, you, know, you can get these in bulk. They've got local distribution. If you, if you do it at scale, you can probably get it for 1 to 2K, so no problem there. <laughs> if you want to test these things and not fry yourself, you can get, you can get like real telco-grade uh, attenuators. We got this one just off of Taiwanese website, so we can actually do all the fiddling. This is on my deck. Um, did that pop up? Sorry, this is being a little slow. Okay, so uh, for actually running the software, so the way that we've built this, you actually have to run a number of software because you have to build an LTE stack, right? And so to do that, you can buy a $100 box from Amazon. That's no problem. You have to ruggedize it. That's actually not a big issue. And the software's out there. So um, the software that we're using is uh, from Open Air Interface. This is an LTE software stack. There's been a lot of contribution from a number of people towards it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the software before, but it's kind of a traditional SDN thing. It looks very much like kind of the network virtualization stuff that we were doing before. Um, I mean, there's only so many ways that you can cook this. And so, like, listen, this is a fully working setup on my deck, uh, and it took maybe half an hour, 45 minutes to get everything working. And this is a 10-watt setup. It'll give you 10 kilometers of range for pure cellular. And uh, for most of the locations we're looking at, you know, two or three cell towers, you can cover an entire, entire city for 2030K. Let me talk a little bit more about the actual SDN stack. Um, so, so the idea is the following. Like normally with LTE, you have to set up an LTE core. I mean, there's a bunch of different components. This is not a new idea. There's a ton of papers that talk about it, but here's a working instance of it. So the basic idea is like every node B you set up basically is going to have this gateway, which is a distributed EPC. And then all it requires on the back end is IP. That IP can come from anywhere, right? It can be, you know, microwave to a school. It can be VSAT to a satellite. You name it. So, like, listen, if you want to stand up one of these cell towers in sub-Saharan Africa and use VSAT, go for it. If you want to do what we're doing, backhaul it to a school, you can go ahead and do that. And the EPC is fully distributed. So to scale it out, you're not, like, you know, dealing with an LTE core. You just stand up as many cell towers as you want. You connect them to IP. And then we literally run the control plane Actually, the management plane. So the control plane is distributed. You run the management plane in AWS, and you're done. So you basically have a fully like, functional cellular network with a management plane, a portal, um, and you can handle you know, data and mobility and things like this on top of that. And it's very easy to build, and it's very easy to scale out. Let me talk a little bit about Spectrum. Uh, OK, so here's the thing. Um, <laughs> you, you basically, the bottom line is, you have to work with an educational institute, and you have to deal with a lot of lawyers. But if you do that, there's no reason that you can't get access to EBS Spectrum. Um, I mean, I just kind of uh, cribbed from the actual um, uh, verbiage of EBS. But it has to be an accredited institution. And what's interesting about working in the educational space, which I really um, didn't appreciate, is how willing people are to work with you um, to do these types of things. And so for our model, as we'll go to uh, the school will work, we'll get the EBS spectrum, we'll actually give the spectrum to the tribal authority so, so that the tribe owns the spectrum, they can do whatever they want with it, and then we just use that to provide the connectivity. Okay, talk about backhaul, I mentioned this before. Uh, it just, um, you know, this is again from, this is from the Navajos. There's a, it turns out there's a ton of fiber out there. It was so funny, when we were starting this, everybody was like, what about backhaul, what about fiber? It turns out, as far as I'm concerned, it's just not an issue. I mean, in every location we're looking at, like, seriously, you have 80% of people that don't have access to cell service, and there's fiber within 5K. Right? And I mean, this whole thing to me is actually a little, a little bizarre that we ended up in this situation to begin with. And, 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 and by the way, for me, it comes down to the fact that it's spectrum, and it's people that can't build a solvent business model. If you open up the spectrum issue, this problem gets solved overnight. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's our, our general recipe. So you apply for the spectrum with an accredited school, 5K to 10K of lawyer bills. Uh, I know the lawyer for you. He's fantastic. If you guys are interested in this, like, I'll connect you with him. He's fantastic. Um, so, you know, access the bandwidth, set up some cell towers. I'm going to walk through an example that's very close by here in just a moment. So as far as the, the customer premise or the homes, you either give them these little kind of MiFi's, which will convert cellular to Wi-Fi. You can get these from Alibaba for 10 bucks a pop. Uh, right now, what we're working with are, are kind of external CPEs that are about 200 bucks a pop, but it's like super cheap, man, to like connect a house to the internet. The reason that we're using external CPEs is just for range. If you're using internal MiFi's, like you don't get the range that you do otherwise. Um, and then, and then that's it. And then people have access to the internet, and you know now, like you know, kids that go to school can actually do homework. So let me give you an example of Pete Spring. So actually, after this talk, 
I'll be here for a little while and I'm heading out to Peach Springs to work on this. That's the Wallapai Reservation. And tomorrow I hop on a helicopter and we go to the Havasupai to talk to the Havasupai at the bottom of the canyon. Similar thing. It's like pretty much every tribe that you talk to has like some portion of this problem. I just want to give you a sense of, of, of how these things play out. So here's uh, the spectrum match, uh, map for uh, Speech Springs, Arizona, Wallapai Reservation. This is Route 66. You know, it's like the classic Route 66. Super cool drive. I, I encourage you to go. So the, that big density uh, up there on the top left, that's Las Vegas. That's where we are now. Clearly, all the spectrum is used there. Flagstaff, you know, spectrum's used there. Peach Springs, as you can see, um, because people didn't think it was profitable, decided not to get the spectrum so you can have access to EBS spectrum there. So the first thing that we do is we actually take a look of the spectrum that's allocated. We look for the EBS. Um, we get that. And then we go on site. This is going to be a little, I apologize for the eye chart. This is going to be a little hard to see. But um, you want to go on site and you want to identify like where you're going to set up cell towers. Right? So this is a topography of Peach Springs. I've I, uh, annotated two things. One's a radio tower and another is a water tank. I'm going to actually show you a picture of those in a second. So these are both like on hills. You have full access to, it turns out they actually have electricity, woohoo, which actually doesn't happen that often. Often, like you're doing a solar setup, which is another 5K, but it's totally doable. Um, so it has electricity. Uh, and uh, in the um, radio tower uh, case, it actually has a backhaul too already there. So that's great. Just to give you a picture of what those look like. There's the water tower, so you can climb on that. You can just throw a little cell tower on there. Here's the, the television antenna, uh, which is an existing radio tower. And so with just those two points, Peach Springs, the population density, if you look at the water tower uh, or the radio tower and the water tank, basically everything kind of north or top there is Peach Springs. And you can get, basically get full coverage with a, with a, a 10 watt setup. You know, so the bottom line to me is like, listen, <laughs> here's a community that like, desperately needs it. There's many of them out there. You can solve the problem for 10K, literally, um, as long as you have the right well, actually, no, probably 20K. 20K because you've got two towers, but you have to have the right things in place in order to do that. Um, and so the question is, is can you turn this into a repeatable model where you actually have the blueprints, you have the website, you have the community, and you have people do their own enablement? Because there's no way a central organization to do this. I mean, this really has to be an organic thing. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude with that. Um, I just want a little bit about the status. So we're hyper, hyper um, kind of human constrained at the moment. Like we've got a lot more work than we know what to do with. Um, we've got three pretty significant engagements underway. This is all trial stuff, man. Like, listen, if, if I'm invited back next year in the upcoming years, I'll tell you whether the model actually works from can you get the OPEX cost down? You know, like, you know, like we know the technology works. You guys in the audience all know this technology. I'm not telling you anything new. So we know that we can get this stuff to work. But can you actually make this a scalable model where people are able to administer it with a low OPEX? I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'm, I'm like, I'm working to, to, to answer that for you. Um, so that's why we're going to have uh, viability results by the end of the year. Listen, if anybody's interested in helping, just let me know. Like, you know, we've got this, this, this funny organization, but uh, we're always looking for help. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and end, and I think we're going to do the panel now. So thanks very much. I really appreciate it.